Well, let's let's make a start then. Um, as you will have probably have spotted, uh, I am not in fact Lee Dodds. My name is uh, Tim Hill. Uh, I recently joined the Open Data Institute um, as data standards and technical lead, basically to shoulder a lot of the work that Lee and Nick uh, Evans have been doing lately. Uh, so both of them have got a lot of commitments. Uh, I'm on Open Active full time, so I'll be I'll be leading the data standards work uh, for the coming year. And that's really what this call is going to be about, is setting out a tentative roadmap for how that work proceeds. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been with the ODI long enough to get my own login credentials, which is why I'm appearing as Lee right now. Um, but maybe if for my benefit and possibly for other people's benefits, if we could just go around and introduce ourselves, uh, that would be great. Uh, so over to you. Next person on my screen is Paul Morgan. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Paul Morgan. I'm lead developer with the Canon River Trust. Uh, Andy Woods. Sorry, can anyone else hear Andy right now? I'm afraid I'm not getting any. I'm getting a very tinny oh, he's echo. In the bathtub. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Andy. Yeah, we're not hearing you there. It's really faint, yeah. Can you get any closer to a microphone? How about now? Better. Yeah, better. Um, oh, it's sorry, sorry, worse again now, I'm afraid. Um, it sounds to me like maybe you're maybe you're plugged in, but the microphone in your headset's not what's picking you up, something like that. Uh, Andy, if it's useful, if you press the little up arrow next to the mute button on the screen, you'll see there's a switch to phone audio, and you could actually dial in and join the audio through your phone. That might be a better option. Okay, well, we'll let uh, Andy start. Well, yeah, I can say, um, for, so Andy is uh, works in my team at the National Trust, so Andy is recently... Um, started as our GIS data officer uh, looking at the paths project so he's charged with coming up with a process for capturing all of our paths into OpenStreetMap. Oh okay great I can see why he wants to be on the call yes. <laughs> um, Nick can you introduce yourself I'm sure everyone here knows Nick but uh, might be worth refreshing. Not sure everyone here does actually, but um, yeah, so I, I'm uh, Nick Evans. Uh, I'm uh, on the Open Active team at the Open Data Institute, uh, a technical engagement lead, and I've been doing this for uh, a, a fair while. Um, I also have another role, which is uh, I'm in, um, but on this call, I'll be representing the, um, the Open Data Institute and Open Active. Um, David Brownlee. Hi, I'm David from Trainers One. Uh, we provide personalized AI running coach, and we're very interested in being able to give people ideal running routes. Excellent. Um, Chris Poynton. Hi, I'm uh, Chris from Racefully. Uh, we uh, allow people to walk, run, and cycle together virtually at a distance. We're not a route finding app right now, but it is a a neat shortcut way to add some uh, route finding to people so they can run together uh, in the place where they are. Um, that would be quite interesting to learn about, so that's why I'm asking. Fantastic. Um, Mark Pavlitsky and uh, Helen thomas Fox. Hi. So, um, yes, it's Helen and Mark here. We're from the Forestry England, formerly known as Forestry Commission England. Mm -hmm. um, and we're here, we've not um, sat in on these calls before, so we're completely new, um, but we're here because we're, we're looking to see how in the long term we can provide our data or get our data in a way that can be used by other apps. But we are right at the very beginning of the journey. Okay, well, I think this is a great time to join because we're, we're not at the very beginning of our journey, but we're certainly, we're taking the first practical steps. I think we've outlined, we're outlining a path right now. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a good time to be jumping in. 
Um, and Ian, I believe I believe you introduced Andy, uh, but possibly not yourself. Hi, yeah, uh, this is uh, Ian Dawes at National Trust. Um, so we're I'm heading up department looking at the technical side of uh, capturing paths, um, which is part of our um, active outdoors project. So you might come across other colleagues of mine, uh, Liz Nelstrop or various others. Uh, so we're basically trying to complete refresh our walk offer. Um, so we're involved on the GIS technical side, so actually capturing our paths. Uh, Liz and her team are more about the trails, so taking those paths and turning them into curated trails. So that's where I'm coming from. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I think that's uh, everyone introduced. Please shout if I've missed you. There's two Chrises. There's a Chris Walker and a Chris Pointing, I think. Ah, oh, you're right. Yes. Sorry. Uh, it's the aptly named Chris Walker. Uh, could you could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Chris Walker. Are you there? I'm ping him on chat. Um, Nick, I noticed that Chris has got his video turned off and absolutely no icon whatsoever for a microphone. Uh, that, that might well be because he's not enabled audio. So I guess, Chris, if you can hear us, well, he won't be able to, will he? Because he hasn't got audio on. <laughs> no, okay. he'll have to, he, he'll, if he presses the bottom right, uh, bottom left button and switch to phone audio, that's probably the best thing. Um, or you can connect to internet uh, online audio, whatever it's called. But you'll need he's, saying, he's saying on the chat he can't hear anything, so it's probably best to come out and come back in, maybe. Yeah, that's a good idea. What about Chris Pointing? I already did okay. me. Uh, I'm from Race Clay. Oh, yes, thanks. No problem. And uh, so we've got, um, we've got 44787073. Is that, is that Chris Walker joining? Do we know? Must be. It could be Andy. Hmm. Chris has dropped out now, so I guess he's going yeah. to come back in. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, is this Chris Hi. Walker? Hi. This is Andy Woods. Sorry, oh. I um, I just um able to sort of dial back in. Um, I, I believe I could still hear you, so I believe Ian has introduced myself. But yeah, just the GIS um, data officer for the past project at the National at the National Trust. Okay, thanks very much. And yes, you're coming through loud and clear now. That's great. Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm afraid I'm afraid Chris is uh, Chris Walker is absent with a leave for the moment. Um, Unless anyone else has got any other technical suggestion for him besides dropping out and coming back in or trying uh, phone audio, I think we'll just have to proceed. I was going to say, yeah, uh, to try and resolve it if you want to carry on. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, I will then try to um, share my screen with you uh, so we can share some slides. Um, let's see here. Nope, that was not the tab I wanted. Here we go. Okay, so is everybody seeing um, the, the slide presentation? Yes. 
Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so we've done introductions. Um, the main purpose of this call is to, on a very high level, outline the roadmap for specification development over the next year. Um, there's going to be a certain lack of detail in how far we can go into accessibility. There's this two headline standards that we're going to be needing to develop and one stretch goal that I've defined. Um, Andy, uh, could you uh, mute your phone, please? I think your, your audio is bouncing back from you while Lee's speaking. Yeah, sure. Um, does anyone know the, the shortcut to mute the phone? You dialed in, it's just mute on, the, on, your, on your mobile. It sure worked. Okay, <laughs> worked too well. Um, um, okay, uh, I'll resume. So we've got two areas of major work that have to be done over the course of the year. Uh, one of them is roots, which I think most people here on this call are specifically interested in. And this is the one where we can go into most detail. Uh, the other really important tranche of work is on accessibility. Um, I don't think anybody here is going to want to ignore that. Um, the difficulty with accessibility is that we really have to ensure that we've got very broad community representation there. And I'm waiting to hear back from Izzy Champion in uh, Sport England about Sport England's ability to convene some of the people that we really need to consult with to talk about this. Uh, so I think for the purposes of this call, when we talk about accessibility, we can talk about some very high level uh, considerations, but we're probably going to need to hold off on anything more fine grained until we've got Izzy in a call. Um, and then the final goal, which we can look at if we've got time is difficulty level, which I see has been discussed at previous calls. Um, Partly, this is this has arisen most specifically with regard to roots and how we describe how difficult a root is. And I saw in the news that actually, um, I think as Ordnance Survey is recalculating how the difficulty of roots is assessed and the time recommendation for roots is assessed. Um, it might be worth widening out that conversation to include physical activities in general. Uh, but that's something we can get to at the end of the call if we have time and at the end of the year if we have time equally. Um, and then of course there'll be time at the end of the call for any other business that people have got arising. So I've got a link in here. I, th I know that some of you have, have taken a look at it. Um, I've got a link in here to a roadmap document that I've defined. Um, this was slightly finger in the air in terms of, of timing. Um, broadly speaking, roots is the first consideration given in the roadmap, and I'm just gonna click on there. Um, if you take a look at the roadmap, I've got work on roots starting on the 31st of this month, and then proceeding through a series of stages and can you continue on until the, the third quarter. Um, after that, it would be the time to look at accessibility, which is when I think Sport England is going to be more able to engage with that work and possibly difficulty level if we have a chance to, to take a look at that. Um, broadly speaking with roots, um, where we've got to so far, and Nick might want to jump in and nuance this a bit, but the last call that regarded roots, um, matters were still very undefined. It was still very open season for defining the specification. And the main issue that seemed to have arisen was that there was a distinction observed between the route itself, i.e. the trail that people are going to physically walk on and its representation on the map so that they can learn about it, and the kinds of activities associated with the route. Um, so for instance, on a single route, you might cycle on that route, you might walk on that route, you might run on that route, you might have a treasure hunt on that route, you might have points of historical interest on that route. Um, so a distinction 
was being observed between what was being called the root, which is the root proper, and then the root use, which was the activity that would take place on that root. And the feeling was that different user communities would want to describe the root uses in different ways, uh, and that we had to be able to weave that into the specification somehow. So there's a distinction between the, the geographical sense of root and the active or pragmatic sense of root. Um, however, as far as I know, uh, there hasn't been any, any work undertaken in actually defining that difference and how the two relate to each other. It was agreed that we did need to have this distinction, but there hasn't been any further work done on actually defining that in any detail. Nick, does that tally with your understanding of where we got to with root and root use? Yep, spot on. Spot on, okay, great. Um, so my thinking there was outline what I'm calling root 0 0.1 as an editor's draft, which enshrines that distinction and have that done by the end of this month. Um, and throw that open for consultation by the community. And by community, I mean largely people on this call right now and a few others from whom I've, I've received apologies. Um, so I would like to press ahead with that quite quickly and then have that open for public review uh, for, let's see, um, until the publication of Roots 1. And the difference with root one is that um, for a lot of routes, according to Izzy at Sport England, there's going to be a lot of legal considerations that there's differences between bridle paths and running trails and uh, public use roads and open roads and this kind of thing. Um, so we're going to need to find ways of, well, first of all, we're going to need legal consultation to, to find out what the relevant distinctions are. And then we're going to need to find some way of encoding those into the specification. So Roots 1.0 release would really be um, combine the root and root use distinction with that legal, um, with the ability to encode legal information. Um, oh, sorry, I've got this slightly, sorry, uh, sorry, one thing I'm leaving out. The other point is, I think we need to do a bit of an audit of what root data we actually have. Um, so some groups of people like Ordnance Survey uh, have got very fine-grained, very geographically, you know, aware um, routes that are that are encoded onto Ordnance Survey maps that are using latitude and longitude and existing uh, geo location specifications to describe data. At other points, though, we might be looking at organizations that just have, you know, a PDF of of what a route would be, um, or maybe even just a, a drawing of or or written instructions as to how to follow a route in terms of landmarks and that kind of thing. Um, so we probably need to do a bit of an audit to determine what the minimum useful specification is for a route. Um, do we want to insist that people have got uh, loads and loads of um, nicely geotagged uh, route information or are we happy to have you know hand-drawn facsimiles or verbal instructions that kind of thing um, so i've blocked this out into three phases uh 0 0.1 root 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 and root use by the end of the month um legal consultation completed by the middle of june and a review of root data finished by the end of june all of which is aiming for getting the first editor's draft out um, by the end of August and having that at candidate release stage by the last week in September. Um, so I suppose there's a frenetic intensive activity through uh, June mostly, uh, and then a review process and um, rewriting process going through uh, July and August with an endpoint of September um, for publication of that as a candidate release. Now, um, I guess at this point, I'd just like to pause and, and get any feedback you might have on that, um, partly about whether I've missed anything in terms of what should go into the spec, and then secondly, as to whether that actually seems like a realistic and doable timeline to people on the call. What do you um, envisage the legal consultation 
to to actually give you feedback on the um, I don't quite follow what legal advice you need at the early stage. Um, I'm a little bit vague myself, to be honest. Um, I'm going off what, what Izzy Champion of Sport England has told me, that essentially for, especially for rambling, this is where this tends to come up, um, there are three or four different kinds of paths to which the public has different kinds of access. Um, and presumably, if we're going to be publishing root information, we need to associate that with some information about who can go where or when, basically. Uh, so we need some clarification as to, yeah, what the, what those distinctions are, basically. Gotcha. So that might include also, uh, you know, places you could ride a horse, but you can't ride a bike or things like that as well. So restrictions on use, not just legal ones, but just, I, I guess there's also, you know, if there's a route around the inside of a stately home that the National Trust has and you have to pay to get in, there's, there's kind of restriction based on it being uh, an entrance fee to get in. Um, if it's accessible to the public, it's not freely accessible. Ah, okay, that's interesting. That's actually s slightly different from what I was thinking of. Yeah, I was worried specifically about this kind of typical rambling thing of, you know, are you going across somebody's field when you don't have right of way? Um, but yeah, there might yeah. be other restrictions, commercial restrictions or, or access restrictions. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's various uh, ones around that. Uh, things like dog walking um, and what you can say about dogs on leads on different um, areas at different times of year. So there's quite a few things, particularly around dog walking. But as you mentioned, uh, I think it's fairly clear cut on things like footpaths, bridleways, restricted byways, highways. But the bigger complication is on the uh, uh, permissive paths, that is paths that Lando said you can access, and it's on what basis you can access and what stipulations you can put on that. Okay, right, and that could be, from what you just said, I gather that could be quite bespoke, that it could vary quite a bit from landowner to landowner? Yeah, that, and trying to get a standard definition of that that people can pick up to create the routes. Uh, yeah, we're just at the start of that journey at the National Trust. We're just trying to work out exactly what those differences and how to tag those. So we're planning to use OpenStreetMap to capture all that. Uh, sorry about the background noise. That's a bit of a hailstorm um, here. <laughs> yeah, I've got thunder rumbling in my direction as well. <laughs> hey, but there's a, just as an observation, you mentioned times. That's a good point as well. I um, went for one of my regular routes just recently on a run. And I couldn't do a chunk of it because the uh, uh, nesting birds there and uh, the, the owners had closed off the path, had to do a detour around it because of nesting birds. It, there's all sorts of things that can mean that we probably should somewhat disclaim routes and make sure that people understand they should be following posted advice on their way around and that kind of thing. Okay. Um... I've just summarized. Okay, I've just summarized that here as pragmatic consultation and posted advice. I've taken some more written notes. Um, so that sounds like there's a separate tranche of concerns, which might be more difficult than the legal concerns in some ways, um, or less an less readily answerable. Um, and that needs to be slotted in somewhere. Um, yeah, and the other thing we found. As we've done a few of the pilots are the um, differences between the official register versus the actual uh, desire lines and the actual routes on the ground and how you handle that where paths have moved from the official designation uh, or where that official register is wrong is just mm. it's not always correct so there are a few issues when you actually get down to do you meet this line here you actually get people to put down what's in their heads and over the years of accumulated sort of knowledge when you actually keep trying to get that down on a map they can raise various issues right and i think this is something that came out in an earlier roots call um yeah sort of about who's confirmed that or who guarantees that a route is as described yeah there's there is some kind of work to be done around um, confidence, <laughs> confidence and ownership um, about about 
roots and their accurate description, I suppose. Um, okay, I'll include that as well. Have you got sort of one word that you use to describe or one phrase that you use to describe that concern or is this kind of a more nebulous issue? It's slightly more, more nebulous, but generally um, entitlement is the, the phrase we'd use, entitlement to use roots or paths. Um, and with and with regard to the the differences between uh, described and observed paths, is there a a term of art for that? Uh, it tends to be called um, desire lines, the uh, which is slightly different, but that's basically the shortest route where people want to go between places, whether or not it is actually. A legal definition or not. Okay, right. Okay, interesting. Um, Could we keep the, um, the as a, a separate line, the previous value you had as well about pragmatic side of things because um, certainly we, we have the certain problems between seasonal um, seasonal navigations along say canals and stuff where something in the a place in the summer might be perfectly passable by everyone but in the winter it becomes a bit of a quagmire or certain parts of it would be and um, we also have the concept of stoppages so sometimes the canal will um, you know be losing water or a bank will break and we have to close the towpaths as well so that you know the the guys and girls that are working to, to fix it can't actually let people buy so there's a health and safety issue there mm -hmm. okay um hold on So do we effectively have? Oh, sorry, go. Uh, I think, I uh, I think it was David Brownlee who was speaking. David, are you on mute right now? Or perhaps low signal. Yeah, it sounds like a signal because he's playing with. Sporadic. Right. Okay. Um, hmm, that's too bad. It sounds like he was about to say something quite. <laughs> quite no, I dropped out for a moment. Uh, I may be back. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can, I can hear, hear you. you. Yeah. I was about to say, does, do we effectively have root sessions? There's some metadata oh. on top of roots that indicates when and where. Yeah, you mentioned it this. Be and the different characteristics they're in. Yeah, you mentioned this in this. Um, there's an issue under the um, under the more general uh, modelling opportunity data, isn't there, called uh, issue 108, which was a proposal for routes. Uh, and I think you put some stuff in there, and I put some stuff in there as well. That those would be really good things to try and incorporate at some point if people can look over that. Okay, sure. Um... Okay, yeah, so those are those are logged on the issue. Um, I will modify accordingly. Um, I put a link to the issue in the chat, so if anyone wants to go and look over that and refresh themselves, they can do. Okay, fantastic. Um, now, with regard to a lot of this, it seems as though it seems like a lot of this would be almost free text that there's such a, a wide range of possibilities um, that you know things like seasonality or stoppages um, it's going to be hard to capture that I would have thought with you know in any kind of strictly formal way that it's a kind of natural language kind of issue does that does that sound about right uh, no we, we quantify it quite well in, in terms of down to the geolocation side of things uh, using line strings, times, dates, uh, the reason for the closure. So we do have a, a free text area for description to provide more context, but we've got them, uh, yeah, like I say, quite formalized, that format itself. Oh, okay, good. Um, <laughs> makes the drafting of a standard um, more difficult, but certainly makes it more useful once it's drafted, yeah. Okay. Um, I am now embarrassingly going to see if I can um, 
just jump on to 108 there. You said you shared that in the chat? Fantastic. Uh, so your abs is zero? No, I'm Paul Morgan. Uh, no, Brownlee, Dave Brownlee, I think, is abs zero, and then I'm Blavy Boy in that, in that commentary. Oh, okay, right. Guilty as charged from abs zero, then. Okay, and which issue specifically were you um, were you flagging up in this thread? Because there's a lot of concerns in this thread. Well, it was just referencing the point. So there, I think David's reference sessions in there. Uh, I've referenced some other things, but his point about um, how how uh, routes might be related to sessions might be filled out a bit more in there. Is that right, David? Yes. I think whatever we're doing here, there's a base route and then there's metadata built on top of it, which may be sessions and combined with um, accessibility and everything else. Mm -hmm. As you say, they'll change seasonally and whatever. Okay, I think this probably, um, compli this probably intersects with the question of the distinction between root and root use that I began with. Um, Okay, so maybe it's worth re-describing the root root use issue as possibly involving this notion of session. So that would be something that we'd fold into the 0 0.1 um, specification because that's going to be that's going to be quite a fundamental distinction, um, and we have to get it right fairly early on, or it's going to break things later. It might be worth saying that I think there's probably a mirror here between the other types of, um, of data we've got in the modeling spec. So the facility use, which describes a ba basketball court um, that is in a particular leisure center, which that, that is a thing and a, a type. And then related to that are slots. And those slots are kind of much more timely and describe specifically when you can book that particular facility use. The same goes for session series which is a general description of a session that occurs over a number of weeks and a scheduled session, which is a um, that one particular week. And what happens with in both of those cases is that the, the specific event, which is uh, the things that are, are subclassed off event, which is the session series, the scheduled session and the slot, they get updated really frequently. And so they're actually in, in most cases in separate feeds to the um, facility use or the session series, which get updated much less frequently. So it sounds like there might be a similar thing here where there's the kind of the basic route that is pretty static, and then there might be some more live data around um, what happens on the route or when it's available or closed and things like that. Um, but just wondering if that might be some useful analogy to take across. Okay, I've, I've, I've... I uh, lengthen the description of the root 0.1 draft, saying that we have to look maybe just at the opportunity model more generally and take a look at how the roots uh, specification mirrors that or conveys that same kind of information. Does that sound like a good summary, Nick? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, okay, any, any further concerns from anyone? I mean, I think this is, these are really big meaty issues that have been identified. So there's, there's a lot wrapped up in that, but are there other points that uh, haven't been made yet on uh, routes 1.0 and 0 0.1? Uh, purely from, again, from that referencing that other, that other um, issue, mm -hmm. it would be good if we could get waypoints in as well, um, just from, from our perspective. Uh, we'd like to see them in there if possible. So there's the route itself, and then there's, there's points along those routes where you can indicate elevation or the condition changes, um, the times between the different waypoints. So if you want to try and work out how difficult a walk or a run or whatever is, um, that might be useful. So you've got the, the route as a whole, which you might say takes an hour or whatever to do, but there might be points where you can see if you only want to do like a half hour run or something like that, you can get to this point here, turn around and, and then go off. So, uh, that's the main thing I think from from my perspective is if we could include that as a, a sub-object or an array of objects of, of sorts or types. 
Okay, that, that does lead me nicely onto, onto Roots 2.0 um, because that was, um, I had what I was calling segments, or rather I wasn't calling segments, I stole that from the issue. Um, so segments and waypoints, that was something I was thinking could go into a subsequent specification later in the year. Um, and that would be part of 2.0, uh, where we would get a more fine-grained description of individual elements along the route. Um, is, this, is this something that you feel absolutely would have to go into any specification in order to be useful to you? Or is this something that could hang on until a subsequent release? Uh, no, that's fine. It can hang on. I mean, if, if we were, if we published our own, I suppose, waypoints based on what we thought the spec might be, I mean, we, we suppose we could go ahead and do that. As long as it's not forgotten, I think it's an, it's an important um, attribute of a route. Yeah, I think, I think certainly segments can't be forgotten in the sense that once you start trying to get any kind of detail about a route, um, you know, what, because if you look at the rest of Roots 2.0, there's, there's bits about surface and elevation. And of course, those are things that are sort of pretty difficult to convey about a route as a whole. Um, likewise, user annotation, which was my way of summarizing the desire to be able to associate, for instance, photographs with points along the route. Um, once you start getting more information about the route, you do really have to be able to localize it a bit more. So I think the idea of waypoints is going to be fundamental to 2.0. Um, although what information you can associate with waypoints is, a, is an open issue, I guess. On that, uh, on the user annotation side of things, would that be as simple as well as sort of like a star ranking system, that, you know, as varied as that through to uh, images? I mean, they, they all sound attractive. I just wondered what, what else is wrapped up in that, please. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I think that's a discussion we'd have to have closer to the time. Um, there's a use case drafting point of work um, defined above that for, let's see here, uh, for the beginning of July and, or sorry, well, through July, basically. Um, I think that's where that finer grain detail would fall out of. Um, Obviously, we can't have just anything assertable about any point along the route, uh, but picking out what the most useful assertions would be would be extremely useful at that point. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah I just mentioned I just mentioned photographs only because I know it had come up in a previous call, so I know it's something that's desired, but it wasn't um, an exhaustive list. In the two point zero spec, from uh, sort of a activity tracking app point of view, like us. Um, wayfinding would be at least good to have in the consideration set. So it's like keep running for two kilometers, turn left of the tree, um, you know, so, so, so that we can actually, uh, it, it sort of goes along with segments and waypoints, but if we can have wayfinding as a concept, it would be good to um, at least think that through. Okay, and that's interesting, and that also ties in a little bit to the earlier versions of the spec, where we have to decide what what characteristics minimally describe a route. You know, it could be you know is is just wayfinding sufficient? Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, certainly we can consider that in the two point zero if we don't get to that early. Yeah. I'm just looking at the list of uh, of, of things on the spreadsheet there. I, just, I noticed use cases um, uh, number seventy six. Uh, I just wonder whether having uh, use cases a bit earlier on, maybe from the people on the call, for example, or even to get a sense of which system would adopt which feature if the feature was to be included mm -hmm. in the spec, um, might be a good way of helping everyone understand what kind of tangibly uh, the value of these things are to each other. So, you know, what, where, where we could discuss the value of waypoints, you know, what, what would they be used for? Sounds like we've already got some of the answers on the call, but I wondered if having a comprehensive view of that I guess a little bit like what we ended up having with booking, where everyone had very different requirements, um, but we we kind of got to the minimal subset that was that was viable for for kind of everyone to have a go at version one. Um, it took a quite a bit of doing to get everybody to kind of say actually what they needed. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if we did that up front here, that that might help um, make sure that version one would be useful to everybody. I, I, assuming that there's more nuance in it than just you know a route 
with basic properties. It sounds like there's more to it. Yeah, and certainly we don't, I guess we don't know how much there is to it until we have the use cases in a sense. Um, what was the procedure for, for getting those use cases in booking? Uh, we had a workshop. Okay. Uh, where we had everyone in the room and we, um, we kind of went through a um, uh, number of exercises to, to kind of uh, enumerate those and then put it into document and then uh, shared that out. Okay, so this was like a one day kind of event? Yeah, yeah, four hours, kind of, yeah, that's that type of thing in the year, starting at 10, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. Okay. Um, if, it worked, if it worked for booking, I would certainly be um, open to considering it for, um, uh, for routes. Um, and it certainly stops the sort of email bouncing around kind of shared document mess that can happen and, and spin out for, for weeks at a time. Uh, how do other people on the call feel about a, a workshop approach? What's your name? Uh, sorry, say again? Sorry, that was works for me. Okay, works for you. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, it makes sense. I think it's probably more efficient than trying to uh, chase documents around. Okay, um, then maybe Nick and I can get together after the call and talk about um, how we start planning that out pragmatically then. Yeah, um, and I'm actually, I'm now wondering why I left use cases until so late in the call. I guess because 0 0.1 is, has got fairly clear requirements, but probably we should bump this up cons uh, to it as soon as possible, really. Um, well, I suppose that's the question is I think what we what, what happened with booking is we we had the same thing exactly in fact we had our zero point what ended up being 0 0.3 with what seemed like very specific requirements but it turned out they weren't sufficient for anybody and so we had a beautiful spec but no one wanted to implement it because they didn't actually it, I think it met what everyone felt in the room was a kind of minimum but everyone I think was thinking oh yeah it's a minimum but just not a minimum for me you know it's, it's probably a minimum for somebody else and so when it came down to it uh, it turned out it wasn't a minimum for anyone actually um, but everyone was being very polite and letting everyone else kind of re reduce the scope until uh, it wasn't useful to them so uh, yeah I guess I guess there's something to defend against here if we maybe end the workshop with actual commitment that everyone in the room is happy that if we you know if whatever the post-it notes are left in the ring everyone would actually implement you know within a week or within a month or within some sensible time scale because it added enough value to them that it would be useful. And maybe that's a good kind of gauge of whether everyone's happy with it. Okay, that sounds like a plausible way forward. Um, okay, yeah, Nick, let's, let's you and I pick this conversation up after the call because I'm conscious that we've got um, 15 minutes left on here. Sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, that sounds that sounds like yeah uh, an outcome we want to avoid doing twice, definitely. Um, okay, so further points on on routes before we move on to brief, probably quite briefly to accessibility. Has the Forestry Commission got anything to say? I wondered. Is that right? At the at the moment, um, we're just trying to take it all in because we're completely. Yeah, we're, we're just we're um, just taking it in at the moment, but I don't think we've got anything to add at this particular point. No. Okay, and um, I can I can send you links to what documentation there is after this call, uh, and in fact, there's not much. It's a bit bitty right now because there've been conversations about routes, but I don't think there's been. It's been more sort of feeling towards what the spec would look like than sort of solid finished work. So I'll send you what we've got, uh, but if you're feeling uh, a little bit confused and as if things are a bit in co uh, that's that's not you that's the state of the work I think um, okay that's, that's good to know <laughs> is, is there anybody from um, open street map or something like that that we should be including in this you've got to believe that they've um, they've come across a lot of the problems that we're going to smack headlong into as we get into this um, so it seemed like it'd be good to get someone with a, a, a sort of a mapping and wayfinding background to see if they would give us some time and experience. Okay, I'll talk. I'll talk to Lee about that. Uh, the real Lee, not not me, um, because we do have a good. The ODI does have a good relationship with OpenStreetMap. Um, we're talking to Ordnance Survey a lot, and obviously they've got a lot of expertise about in this kind of area as well. Uh, but it would be great to have OpenStreetMap on board. So I'll talk to Lee about what what connection we've got there. 
I'm, I'm, uh, there's another Slack community called the Spatial Community, uh, and I'm a member in there. And um, there's a hell of a lot of OSMers in there as well. So I'm happy if you want to sort of ask if anyone else can attend or be happy to attend sort of in a, in a personal capacity to help. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just going to ask as well, um, on Slack, if, if it's possible that we could maybe create a root channel so we can talk all around this specification, but in that particular channel, because it, it sounds like we could probably do quite a lot through there as well, share, you know, sharing images, thoughts, et cetera, as they, as they crop up. That makes sense to me. Um, I'm just going to ask Nick if we've got prior experience with, with Slack for this. Is that a good channel for us? Yeah, it works really well if, um, if everybody um, involved is, is on Slack and understands Slack. Um, there's different kind of sub-communities. Some use Slack almost exclusively now, um, and, uh, and some haven't really managed to make their way into it. So uh, I think if we're all happy on this, I, I guess it's almost that if anyone wants to veto it, it's maybe the way to do it or something because, uh, yeah, otherwise we're going to exclude people. But it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really great medium if people are up, up for it. I've got about 40 Slack channels going at the moment, so the 41st won't make any difference to me. <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is the, the strength and, the, and the, the weakness of Slack, isn't it? It proliferates. Um, yeah, I guess the question is how we, how we sweep up the people who aren't so Slack active, um, how we keep pointing them to Slack or how we get people in Slack to engage you know, with other channels and that kind of thing. Oh, I see. Sorry. So there is guidance on this. So um, I think on the I think on the um, the W three C side at the moment, it says that if if any any decisions get made on Slack, they should be written up in GitHub, and GitHub is kind of the um, the place of record for for discussions. Um, when you can have a lot of kind of small back and forth on Slack, and you can probably summarize it into three bullet points after you know a half hour discussion on the, on, on GitHub, because you know that's how these kind of discussions work when they kind of you boil them down. Um, so, so yeah, uh, you absolutely could. And then the mailing list is obviously the kind of catch-all. So I guess keeping with what we currently have, it would be the Slack channel like, for the people who are up for it. And if, if everyone in this conversation is happy, not you know, and don't feel excluded by that, then that kind of works. And then post the issues to GitHub or, or the conclusions to GitHub, uh, and then circulate those on the mailing list um, to s signpost people to where those decisions are being made and invite them in to the conversation either to, to participate at the GitHub level or at the um, or mailing list level even, uh, and then on Slack if they if they want to. Okay, fantastic. So as, as long as we follow our own guidance, uh, we should be okay. Good. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's just move on quickly to hear thoughts on accessibility if people have them. Um, as I say, um, I, I my personal feeling was that we would be relying on Sport England to a large extent to coordinate this effort and in particular to have the links into the various accessibility communities that we need. Uh, but I'm sure some of the organizations represented here today also have concerns in this area. Um, and uh, if so, yeah, please, please do voice them now. I've got, um, I've got all of this delayed until more or less October right now because of the Sport England dependency. Um, I suppose the main sort of drift of the work is that on the one hand, and I believe Nick and Lee have already undertaken some of this work, we need to do a bit of a review of the accessibility information that's out there, that's actually available. And then on the other hand, we actually need to draft a specification and get a sense of what the data would ideally look like. So we've got two tracks there of, of reality and ideal. And then I think probably we need to publish something, um, some guidance for, for implementers and for publishers about how to bridge the two, about the incremental steps you can take to get from, from where people are now to where they ideally would be in future. Um, I think I phrased that as a best practice white paper. Um, in the spreadsheet, I'm not sure that's actually, I'm not sure white paper is actually the desired output, but the general idea would be some kind of more concrete guidance saying, you know, here's, here's what you need to do and here's what you should pay attention to if you want to improve the, the level of support you're offering. But are there particular, um, are there particular points of concern that people on this call have, or is this something that we can 
maybe leave to address a little bit later in consultation with others. Um, I mean, it's fine to leave it for later to a degree, but I, I think we need more than a white paper. So having something like um, various types or, or objects in a way that can be assigned to roots and having that uh, agreed. Um, I think on other parts of the modeling um, work, they've had a, a spreadsheet or a, an air table with the various values in there that everyone's kind of agreed or signed up to. So maybe that, that could be the same there. So you've got, I guess the problem is you've got different types of accessibility problems for people with different, uh, um, I don't know, either you've got physical, you've got you know, the mental side of things uh, within the physical, you've got um, lots of different sort of subcategories, I guess, of, of abilities. And it's making sure that they're all captured in sort of like a, 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 the same way, such that you know, across the different organisations, when you when you publish a route, if it's tagged or categorised as in a particular way for this this sort of ability here, it should mean the, mean the same if another publisher publishes a different route with the same type of, of ability. I, I don't think a best practice white paper will kind of have that level of gravitas or standardisation. Right, yeah. Um, is is there any accessibility information in the um, in the in the booking API and data set at this point? You know that it's suitable for um, you know people with reduced mobility or people with sight problems or whatever it happens to be in terms of the sessions. Is there anything we can factor off to start to build a set of at least where you might hang the considerations from? I mean, it might be worth just me some quick, just in, in 20 seconds, summarizing the last com call that we had around the subject. So uh, to answer your direct question, yep, there are two properties in the in the, in the modeling spec that uh, are, are relevant in booking and relevant in opportunity data publishing. Um, and uh, and they have, and there's a number of, um, there's a vocabulary defined in a kind of draft state, uh, accessibility support uh, is the name of the vocabulary, and it's just got five different um, types of accessibility, that's visual impairment, physical impairment, et cetera. Um, and so that's what um, is that's currently in live live and in use in um, exercise move dance uh, partnerships finder and and some other publishers as well um, and so so there is that there is that at a very high level the challenge from last time uh, the last call is that that is great uh, it's it's been kind of it's been constructed uh, bottom up from all the data sources as a kind of average of what people are capturing um, the strong feeling from all the people who are experts in accessibility on the last call was that it was kind of useless um, and it hasn't really had any user input. It's come from a kind of theoretical, this is what everybody thinks they need, but there's no, we haven't done any user testing with actual, um, you know, potential um, users of that, of that information. Uh, and, and so their, their action they took away and that Sport England kind of took away to help them with was actually getting some user testing and, and figuring out what information would be useful to provide um, to help make people make informed decisions because at the moment the information just saying it's it's suitable for physical impairment is so broad and and basically useless to somebody that that would categorize themselves as in that group of physical impairment um because of you know the range of all of these things I, i'm by no means an expert but um but yeah that, that i think the last action was that they were going to take some time and, and go and do some research but i know that hasn't really happened so that's probably where um at least from what I can see from the last conversation, where some time needs to go, rather than a, a workshop to bring a lot of people into a room um, to, to kind of average out their ideas, because I think that's probably already happened. It's more of a kind of figuring out how do we get the user input that we need from the through the relevant organizations um, and those, those kind of test groups. I'm also wondering, is there anybody who does this well right now? Um, you know, is, is there a particular, I don't know, country or national body somewhere that is felt by disability groups to have done, you know, have done a good job here? Because um, it does feel like we're kind of starting from a, quite a blank canvas, um, which is, you know, in some ways it's an opportunity, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a lot of work if we're going to be the, the world leaders in this. Um, I, just to, to say from, from Forestry England, I'm, I'm not saying that we do this well at all, or even that we do this, but we do, we have links into something called, the, I think it's the um, Business Disability Forum or something. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it's, it's like, a, it's, it's like a, um, 
a focus group that gives you access to, to people with certain disabilities and stuff and so you can you can work with them to make products okay um i think that's something yeah i'll take that to to conversations with izzy of sport england um yeah that wasn't mentioned last time that sounds great yeah i think i've got written down disability business forum because we had a, we had a little seminar about it at work a while ago and that was around making our website more accessible but it was definitely about accessing you know and, and you you know making sure your community is very diverse essentially mm -hmm. it might be worth looking into yeah i think ins i think ensuring adequate coverage of everybody who's you know affected uh is is one of the huge huge questions so i think certainly having having more groups available is is just definitely a strength um okay good uh other thoughts on accessibility with uh with three minutes left to go i'm just going to look on the nhs's change for life side of things and there's an, another site or charity called activityalliance.org.uk which may be applicable i'll just post that in the chat there oh thank you and um i mean there's the bbc sport get inspired so hopefully they do something like and there's the british paralympic association i don't know if he has got a, a contact there or not but i guess the way that they would classify um various types of abilities may be worth looking at um so yeah i mean that's the that's the change for life area where i was looking at that's because i know they're doing a lot more work over the over the next few months aren't they uh, ready for i think it's june or july they're doing another big push yeah um, so i guess is it again with the person to talk to to get through to them yeah and i mean yeah i think sporting would will be well um well placed to to meet with those kinds of official bodies i'm just thinking that probably a big tranche of the work is just going to be scoping actually that looking at the last accessibility call you know there were there were sort of gray areas like things like rehabilitation so people who do not suffer from uh a permanent disability but who are in rehabilitation might also have different needs um so yeah the question the question of scoping and who yeah who needs to be included in the conversations and uh how broadly we want to define matters i guess is going to be the first tranche of work there um so i i, I guess that begins with izzy and talking about these organizations that have been flagged up here and seeing what other organizations we can catch in our net um and then start uh, narrowing and defining points from there um okay well I, I suppose yeah i guess i guess what this points towards is we need another call that's just about accessibility in the fairly near future once i've got something more concrete to you know to discuss um okay um there's one minute left um i'm going to skim over well i'm going to skip difficulty level right now because it was um a stretch and we can always leave that for a subsequent call it has it the desire for a difficulty level vocabulary has been voiced with regard to roots earlier so i think it's worth revisiting but we don't need to do it now um so i'll just move on to uh any other business really um points that i have not touched on and have left with one minute to spare uh any wider thoughts Um, in the email you sent through, you said that it was starting something was starting around about the twenty second of May or something like that. What's that? What's the actual point there? Then is that where you you're, you're sort of gathering now, ready to really sort of hit the hit the uh, hit the road at that point? Yeah. So the idea behind this call was was to be very very high level and talk about specifications generally where we're going, um, and then the next call in two weeks time would be to put a little bit more meat on the bones of the root specification. Uh, probably looking at the very broad question of roots as geographical entity, roots as an activity that people engage in at particular times and in particular ways, and how that maps onto um, you know, root use, as was discussed in the last call, or possibly uh, artifacts from the opportunity model, such as session and slot and that kind of thing. So that will presumably be the agenda of the 22nd call. And so the the roots themselves that we arrive at that will be a sub element to the um, to the model itself. Is that right? 
Yeah, so that I think pending conversation, but it looks like the general consensus is there will be a broad kind of root specification of which one part will be geographically roots, and then the rest of it will be the points at which that intersects with the opportunity model or is aligned with the opportunity model. Okay, so is there, is there a value to maybe also having it as a, as a separate sort of endpoint within an open active feed? Hmm. Good question. Um, I was assuming it, it would be because it's quite different to the other endpoints which we have at the moment, which are session series, sessions, facility use, and uh, slots. Right, but you'd, so with that, you'd still have to traverse all of the events in, in the event model, wouldn't you? And then, and then pull out the, event, uh, the, the routes from each of those. Is that correct? Well, I guess this is getting into the more of the discussion of it, but um, the, the currently British Cycling has routes in its uh, data because the cycling routes related to the events are, you, you could use them as routes in themselves, but they're actually the event, the, the routes that the event follows. Um, but then there's just routes that are routes on their own, right? So th I guess that's where the question is, whether we, because as soon as you can represent a route, you could embed those in events where that's relevant, but you could also represent them on their own. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Okay, and a point for discussion further on the next call, I think. Um, okay, uh, and we're slightly over time now, so I'll, I'll just thank you all, and I will write up, not exactly minutes, but I'll write up a summary of the conversation and circulate it to you all um, sometime before the end of the week. And um, if you've got any questions, just ping me on email and uh, Nick or I can get back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good to meet you all. Thanks guys. Likewise. See you guys. See you. Thank you.